It's the final chapter in our year-long look at BC wine growers. As we enter the winter season, it's a lot more tranquil around wineries with the harvest and fermentations complete and wines aging. For now, much of the work, but not all, takes place indoors. In this episode, we'll be visiting the Fraser Valley region just outside Vancouver to learn of some of the many tasks required to produce sparkling wine. We'll see how flavor and texture is built into Similkamine Chardonnay and complexity in flavor is blended into a single varietal Okanagan Falls Pinot Gris. Our first stop takes us to Lake Country between Kelowna and Vernon for the inaugural tasting of a Botrytis affected Riesling. It's fun to catch up with you today and talk about a subject we haven't discussed yet all year, and that's a late harvest wine. Uh, why a late harvest wine? Why, why did you decide to make it? We've, uh, I don't know, had about uh, 11 vintages now. And um, the one thing that, of course, the Okanagan in BC and Canada is supposed to have is ice wine, which actually doesn't work here at all. It's way too warm where we are. Uh, we did make an attempt, actually, in about the second year that we had a harvest, and we ended up just leaving a bunch of Gewürztraminer hanging out there, and it was terrible looking, and it really wasn't usable. So we realized the site said, hey, if you're ever going to make something, make a botrytis affected or a late harvest. And the biggest demand has really been from our customers in the restaurant. People come that we have a fantastic culinary program. So people come and they really want to have sort of that finishing touch, which we haven't had in our portfolio. So this Matt's going to be making our, our first late harvest Riesling this year. You chose Riesling, Matthew. Is it a, that's a great grape to use for late harvest. Yeah, pretty classic. Uh, you know, the choice behind that is uh, looking for that sweetness, but the Riesling gives us the balance and the acidity. Are there any real challenges to, to like, what do you make the decision to hang it lo- longer? Like, how does all that work? Well, we were trying to encourage, we knew we weren't going to, you know, get to ripeness without the influence of Botrytis, which uh, shrivels the grape and concentrates the sugars. So we had to treat it a little bit differently in the vineyard, keep on canopy pretty, pretty late in the season to encourage that. We got a little bit of, the, of that Botrytis, but it was very clean, just enough to sort of raise in like 50% and bump up the sugars. Yeah. And no, uh, no birds or bears or deer or what, are you out yeah. there fighting them every day? <laughs> Yeah, they were netted for sure. Our, our biggest challenge is birds, definitely, but we kept the nets on and we, we kept them intact pretty good. So your regular Riesling would be picked at how many bricks and what would the late harvest come in at? How do the sugars differ? Um, our regular Riesling comes in around 21, 22 bricks. Um, we picked the late harvest uh, about four weeks after and we got 26 and a half bricks. So just into that select late harvest. Can we have a look at it? What's it look yeah, like? Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. We've, we've got in one of our uh, uh, sort of to-go totes here because it's a small volume. And um, Matt's going to pull a little bit out. And into glass. Unfortunately, we uh, didn't ship you any samples here ahead of time. Yeah, but. it looks it <laughs> looks delicious. I wish I had some. <laughs> yeah, very cool. And now, what would the what would the residual sugar be in this wine versus a regular finished Riesling at fiftieth? Yeah, it's going to be quite sweet. Um, so we've just stopped it. It fermented for about twelve days. We kept the fermentation cold, and then we just stopped it with temperature. Uh, we're around 110, 120 grams per liter of sugar. Wow. And the alcohol will be around 9%. That's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, so how will you bottle it, uh, Curtis? Will it be in big bottles, small bottles? What, what's the plan? <laughs> Magnums. Yeah, you have to, you really have to commit. You're going to have to commit to this one. Uh, no, it's going to be, I think, what is it? Uh, 350? 375. The 375 mil. So, yeah, so half, bo- half bottle. And they're going to be a hawk bottle. So it's going to be kind of like a Gewürztraminer, you know, tall, slender the German hot bottle. So it'll sort of fit into the, the, the appearance will be beautiful and uh, clear clear glass so you can see what you're drinking. So, or is it green glass? Green glass? Or it's clear glass. What do you think about the ageability of the wine? Um, well, I think, you know, with the residual sugar levels quite high, I think it ages quite well. I think that the flavors will develop um, really well over time. And, you know, the ageability should be quite good because it does have a nice acid balance in there as well. And I assume for sure it's going to be under screw cap at 50th. Or screw cap, <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. As long as we can get a screw cap, it'll be under a screw cap. Yeah, and <laughs> finally, can we, buy, can we buy it? Do we have to join a club? How are we going to get this wine? Yeah, it'll probably only be available at the winery. So absolutely, you join the wine club. You can order direct from the winery. 
it'll be predominantly allocated to our restaurants. So there won't be a lot of it, uh, but we'll be able to for sure get it to your door. Uh, but probably not in retail. We didn't, as you can see, it's, it's about yeah. a four by four by four cube of wine. <laughs> yeah. And Matt's uh, actually going to be doing a little bit of barrel work with this wine too, aren't you, Matt? Right at the end. Here. Yeah, we're going to age it in barrel for the next three months and try and get some further development and flavor and flavor on it as well. And uh, yeah, that's the next move for it. That's so interesting. Uh, it's really exciting to to uh, hear someone talk about late harvest wine. I always think they're more complex than ice wines, so they're more interesting, and uh, this will be fun to taste. Uh, really enjoyed chatting to you guys. And I guess is that the end of the harvest for you? Then is that does that wrap up twenty one or? Yeah, definitely. Ah, that's yes, it. it does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. put that one. And how, would, <laughs> and how would you rate the year overall? Um, you know the the quality, the potential is really high. You know, we had such a, a great warm growing season. There's so much flavor and depth and in ripeness. I'm, I'm looking forward to these wines. Mm. It's exciting to see so much energy going into making a late harvest wine, a long overlooked jewel in the Okanagan winemaker's toolbox. Our next stop, 120 kilometers south in Okanagan Falls, features a grape that arrived from Alsace, France to British Columbia in 1976. So today I'm going to go through and taste all of our individual components of our Pinot Gris and then work together to put those into our final blend. So we have a couple of different vineyards, different soil sites, and different fermentation techniques. All of those different components are going to add their own individual flavors and, uh, and texture to this final wine. Do you have a basic plan going in or, or do you know where it's going to go this year or next, because it's this year, do you know where it's going to go? Can you tell us about how the blend will come together? Really one of the important parts for me about winemaking is making sure that the fruit expresses itself. So um, going in, I didn't really have a clear, exact, precise idea of what I wanted from each vineyard. I just wanted it to show what it was going to produce. Um, so we've got some components that are spicy, we've got some more that are fruit forward, um, some more textural components. Essentially, as soon as the um, individual components have finished fermentation, that's when I'm starting this blending process. So then I'll start um, pulling samples, doing blending trials, um, and tasting not only with me, but also other winemakers um, and getting their input as well. So although we're putting this blend together now, I have been working on this blend for about a month now. And can you tell us just briefly about the vessels that you use, what you're going to get from stainless steel or wood or, or concrete or whatever it is that's going to go into the blend? So for each of these different vineyards and the different uh, blocks that I have, I usually did a stainless steel fermented portion and a barrel fermented portion. So the stainless steel is really going to be able to hold on to the beautiful, delicate fruit characteristics, really pretty aromatics. And the barrel portion is going to give it some texture and some richness and roundness. Um, we steered clear of using a bunch of new oak, so you're not going to get a huge amount of like big oaky buttery flavors, mm -hmm. but you're just going to get that kind of texture from the barrel. So I'm going to go ahead and put together the blend now. So I've got a, uh, a portion here that is from our Okanagan Falls here at Vineyard here at Liquidity. So this is the majority of the blend. Um, just based on final volumes and uh, yeah this is the tank fermented portion and then there's also a small portion that is in oak so we'll add that to the blend and then I have another portion from West Oliver again I've got a tank fermented portion and a barrel fermented portion The majority of this blend is actually from um, our Lusitano vineyard here in Okanagan Falls. And then to finish it off, 
There is a splash of a barrel fermented East Oliver section. So all of these individual components, um, based on their final volumes and their ratios, we've created our final blend here. And now the most important part of it is trying it, making sure that we love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're getting some of like the, the richness from the oak on the nose a little bit, but a lot of it is still very much, because the majority was stainless steel fermented, there's still a lot of really beautiful, fresh, fruity aromatics. But you do get that, that oaky component on the, on the palate. So there's some richness, there's some really cool spicy pear notes, um, some nice complexity coming in from those barrel fermented portions. If this is going to be the final blend, what happens now and how important is it? When do you get it together? How long before you bottle it? That sort of thing. We're now going to take all of those barrels that are out there in the winery and transfer them into a bigger tank and blend all of those other tanks together. And we're going to probably start doing that in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then over Christmas break, we'll turn the glycol cooling in and start a process <laughs> called cold stabilization. Um, after that, we'll filter, and this wine is destined to go to bottle the second week of February. Chasing flavor and character seems to be a winter theme, and it's no different as we head 40 kilometers west over the mountains to the Similkameen Valley. There, we'll encounter batonnage, or stirring the lees, and what that means for Chardonnay. We're dropping in on Corselet's winery during a soil sampling used to determine what, if any, amendments the vines might require to remain healthy over the next few years. But at this moment, we're learning about lees and how a winemaker uses them to enhance the texture of the wine. We make one really exciting white wine here that uh, requires this technique for us here at Corselet. Our Chardonnay is designed to be uh, of a rich or textured white wine style. And so that comes with higher ripeness, typically, of course, as a result, uh, higher alcohol wines. And so we need to find balance with lees and texture. And so lees is ultimately solids that are of grape skin, grape seed, pulp, dead yeast cells, all of these things that fall out of wine at, at their new state will fall to the bottom of these tanks or barrels. And uh, we like to stir those, so different techniques are used. We've got, you know, we've got a different rod for, for barrels as opposed to this paddle here that I'm demonstrating for uh, our concrete sphere. And so I've already kind of murked this up a little bit, but what we're doing is trying to get to the bottom of that and we just pulp it back up so that we can resuspend that lees, which ultimately is like, you know, whack of flavor and texture. And so uh, you can see that kind of getting a little bit murky there already. We'll do that about three times a week at this phase. So primary fermentation has complete. We're into secondary fermentation, which is not as violent. And so we do um, uh, assist this lees in finding suspension again by simply stirring uh, and kind of rocking the boat, if you will. So um, lees, just an important part of developing texture and making wines a little bit richer and fatter to find balance in what is um, our Chardonnay stock. Our Chardonnay is a combination of this concrete, which is um, you know, oxidative in a way because concrete is porous. It's complemented by, you know, our standard barrel formats over there, which provide a little bit more of a, an oak seasoning. And so uh, between the two, we find that we maintain a lot of freshness, uh, managed oak influence while, you know, really kind of driving that texture through lees. Lees stirring is done, you know, at this point uh, through mount lactic fermentation three times a week. It takes kind of three, four minutes to do a tank and two, three minutes to do a barrel. So it's pretty quick. And it's also lees contact or resuspending lees is an antioxidant kind of protects wines through aging for low sulfite or, or zero sulfur um, periods. After we've kind of accomplished the, the, the texture or character of lees impact we want in wine, we'll then of course just stop stirring. The lees will settle down. And at that point, we'll simply remove, gently, we'll pump the clear wine off the bottom of the barrel, the bottom of the tank, and separate that lees 
from the wine. So ways that we can separate lees from wine is through, of course, a racking wand or a practice called racking. And so you can see that this valve is positioned above the bottom, which allows us to, we expect our lees to be at least this deep. So if we draw from this valve, we should find some clear juice for our initial lacquer or at this point, clear wine. Our wine or Chardonnay particularly is aged for eight to 10 months, so it doesn't even get filtered. So we'll just simply rack and return a few times, clean the barrels, and we're able to go to bottle as an unfiltered product. Leaving the wild and windy Similkameen Valley, we head west three and a half hours to Langley, located in the much wider and milder Fraser Valley, a mere 40 minutes drive from downtown Vancouver. Township 7's main production facility is on the Naramata bench above Penticton, where they process their grapes, but it's here in the Fraser Valley where they grow the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir for their amazing sparkling wine program. So Mary, tell us about the Langley Estate Vineyard and the home of Sirius. Yeah, well, this vineyard was planted in 2000, so uh, over 20 years old now. And luckily for us, with Sirius, planted with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, perfect for making sparkling wine. So we are now at the point where this vineyard is in the prime for making quality fruit, and we are seeing the rewards of it with our Sirius. And the first series was 2015, is that correct? Is that the one we're seeing in the market now? Or? Yes, that was 2015. So we the harvested in 2015, fermented it and bottled in 2016, and then waited five years on lees to develop complex characters, and then disgorged, riddled, disgorged, and uh, put a cork and cage, and it was ready to go. We head inside, where Mary has set up a rack to demonstrate the art of hand-riddling sparkling wine before disgorging the lees. Like most modern sparkling wine houses, Township 7 has replaced this labor-intensive method mechanically, employing a gyro palette, which can perfect the job in just 72 hours working day and night. Still, like many other producers, the larger bottles, magnums and up, will be hand-riddled as they have been for centuries in Champagne. We now use the Giro pallets. We can put 504 bottles into a cage and it will do the process that I'm going to show you manually. So what the process is manually is the bottles have the leaves here and we want to turn them so they move through these locations and then eventually the leaves will end up here in the cap and the wine will be ready to disgorge. So now that we've finished riddling the bottles and getting all the sediment into the neck, we've frozen the neck so it stays there, and now we're ready to disgorge. And this is quite a process. Oh, that was good. It didn't go very far. And it's got very tiny, small bubbles that you can see. After removing the lees, the bottles are topped up and recorked. There's a final pressure check to make sure the secondary fermentation is complete. So what we would do is we're going to pierce the crown cap and the pressure will be read that's in the bottle. So we have a pressure gauge and basically we just screw it in. It's quite simple piece of equipment, but it's really important for us. And we do this about three or four months after. So now you can see that the pressure's gone up to over five bar. And this is what we want to see. It ensures that the fermentation has completed and that we are good to go. We thank all BC winemakers who gave us their time and a short glimpse into their working lives and to you, the viewers, for following along. We hope that the next time you pick up a bottle of BC wine, you'll think back on all the planning, tending, testing, and labor that took place leading up to your first sip. Because in the end, you really only get what you pay for. <laughs>